So it's been a while since I've covered some processors, desktop side to be honest, uh, because the last thing that I do remember checking out, or at least Mike covered, was the i5 11400F. Uh, in fact, you can check out the video right over here, but this time I'm actually gonna focus a little bit more on AMD's new APUs, specifically the Ryzen 5 5600G and the Ryzen 7 5700G. I mean, look, the new 5000G series has already been covered to death since they've been available for a few months, but we actually wanted to do something different and make a video that's probably a lot more relevant to a lot of you guys looking to buy one of these chips. And that's to talk about the effect of memory speed on them, specifically for gaming on their integrated Radeon graphics cores. Things like what's the sweet spot for memory on these things, which speeds and latencies will get you the best bang for the buck, um, is it a good idea to increase your budget for a faster kit with tighter timings, or does the lower end nature of AMD's processor graphics mean you can get by you know, the more budget focused modules. So think of this as a buying guide for people who want the best combination of price and performance. And let me tell you, there's a lot of interesting results that could save you a few bucks. And speaking of bucks, we actually do need to pay some bills. So let's do that and get back to this. Don't have the time to wait for parts and build your own gaming PC? NZXT Build has your back. Navigate through their simple UI, choose the games you want to play, pick a budget that works, and the configurator will do its magic by offering some options built just for you. Or choose from one of their awesome pre-built setups. Want something more custom? Go crazy building your own dream PC from the ground up. All of these are backed with a two-year all-in-one warranty on parts, labor, and RAM overclocking. Save your time and start gaming right away with NZXT Build. Now available in Australia as well. All right, so let's start things off with a bit of recap. The 5000 G series are the first Ryzen CPUs with integrated graphics available at retail since the 3000 G series was launched two years ago. Um, they're also the first APUs using the Zen 3 architecture. And that's a big deal in my opinion, especially in a world where buying a discrete GPU at a fair price is so damn hard. I mean, it's just really, really hard that if you walk into Best Buy or Micro Center, you might just not find one, which is really frustrating. Now, the Ryzen 5 5600G aligns pretty well with the 5600X, though the six core operates at lower clock speeds since it's supposed to keep the same 65 watts of power consumption, but that's shared between the CPU and integrated graphics. Uh, the Ryzen 7 5700G steps things up to a bit with eight cores and 16 threads running at higher speeds. Now, the key points to differentiate them performance-wise from the X series would be the boost clocks and a massive gap in the amount of available cash. Pricing is supposed to be around $260 US and $360, so they match up perfectly with Intel's 11600 and 11700 series. But remember, those CPUs run at a nominal 95 watts to 125 watts and can reach a lot higher in short bursts. Against AMD CPUs, the 5600X is $60 more expensive than the 5600G, and the 5700G sits right in between the 5600X and the 5800X at $360. Now, both G series also includes a Wraith Stealth Cooler as a bit of an added value bonus, but don't think of these as completely affordable CPUs either. They're actually quite expensive in the grand scheme of things, especially when compared to previous APUs like the 3400G. Anyways, speaking of those integrated GPUs, yeah, the entire 5000G series is still on Vega. Vega, guys. I mean, I swear, that architecture has got more lives than a cat. The 5600G has got seven compute units operating at 1.9 gigahertz, while the 5700G is rocking a core with one more CU and a bit higher clocks, and that's about it. All in all, these APUs actually have a lot more in common uh, with the laptop 5000H series than they do with the desktop Ryzen CPUs. And that's because in order to save power, they actually stuck on a PCI Gen 3 interface for storage and external graphics. They also use the same type of monolithic die, so from what we've seen, um, they actually run quite a bit cooler. As for raw CPU-centric performance, let's actually take a quick look at that and um, get a baseline. Overall, you'll see the same thing repeated over and over again. When it comes to the 5600G versus the 11600K, they trade blows with the 5600G coming out on top in CPU intensive benchmarks, while the Intel one gets ahead in anything that combines some lightly threaded workloads. The same can't be said about how the 5600G lines up with the 5600X, since for the most part, the standard desktop processor is marginally faster right across the board. 
Right now, the 5700G doesn't really align with anything specific in AMD's lineup, though its price sits right between the 5800X and the 5600X. And that's exactly where it lands in performance as well. So nothing unexpected here. And even paired up with an RTX 3090, there really isn't anything that we didn't expect with lightly threaded games like CSGO and Valorant favoring the non-APUs since they're able to hit consistently higher frequencies while also having almost doubled the amount of cash. Then there's a bunch of titles that are slightly more multi-threaded or have a bit of GPU bottlenecking. And in those situations, the difference between the best and worst CPU here is only a few percentage points. So overall, the 5600G and 5700G deliver pretty solid real-world performance given their prices. But in the right scenarios, their gaming capabilities with a discrete GPU feel a bit like the Ryzen 3000 series. Now, it's pretty obvious AMD needed to make some sacrifices to keep their higher-end lineup pretty safe. You also have to remember the 5000G series strengths lie with their integrated graphics, which can help you build an awesome low-powered system for everyday tasks, or um, it can actually help you create like a baseline system uh, because of this GPU situation. You can sort of still use this PC with integrated graphics and wait until the GPU storm sort of calms down. So what we're gonna do right now is dive into the baseline iGP performance quickly before going a bit deeper into how memory speed and latency can affect those results. Now, as we go through these results, a few things are gonna be pretty obvious. First of all is the GT1030, which is literally the only discrete GPU you can find for a semi-okay price these days. And it actually ends up getting pounded into the dirt by the 5000G series. And when you look at Intel, well, don't even get me started. I mean, sure, the Rocket Lake uses a new XCLP graphics architecture, but it's been cut down so much, its performance is just so pathetic. It isn't even really worth mentioning, guys. Obviously, if you wanna run games on integrated graphics, AMD is the only way to go right now. So now that we've got a baseline set up, let's actually get a little bit deeper into the memory portion of this video. So first, I'm actually gonna recommend you guys check out my Ryzen Memory Explained video, which you can find right over here, uh, where you can find or get a bunch of insight into how much the Zen 3 architecture can benefit from picking the right kind of memory. But here's a question. Is the importance of frequencies and timing translatable to the integrated graphics on the 5600G and the 5700G. Well, to find that out, we actually ended up using a single 32 gigabyte kit of dual channel rank memory from G-Skill that operates at a relatively tight CL16 timings. Uh, it was then underclocked or overclocked without modifying any timings, so we could get a controllable testing environment. The goal here is to test some of today's more popular memory speeds of DDR4 2666, 3200, 3600, and 4000. Now, all of that was done with a memory to infinity fabric ratio of one to one to keep things equalized there as well. So I'm gonna pause here right away because what you see is basically gonna continue into the rest of these results. The biggest jump you'll see on these is typically between DDR4 2666 and the Ryzen 5000 series native 3200. It also feels like the more powerful Vega 8 in the 5700G has a bit more performance headroom when ramping up memory clocks. There's other games that'll have another pretty big jump between 3600 and 4000, while for the most part, the benefits of going from 3200 to 3600 really depends on the game you're playing. Some benefit, while others just don't. But overall, there's a pretty linear progression in frame rates as you go up from 3200 to 4000. But I actually wasn't expecting some of these results. I mean, in some cases, we're seeing a 20% or higher uplift in performance at 1080p for 800 megahertz of additional memory speed. That's actually not that bad, guys, and it points towards these graphics cores being memory bottlenecked, even though they're so low on the performance ladder. So the next thing I wanna tackle is memory timings. Now, if you watched that Ryzen memory video that I've been talking about, uh, you'll know that tightening up timings can actually have a lot of positive impacts on real-world CPU performance. But, once again, does the same thing happen to the integrated graphics? Well, to test that out, the team normalized things to Ryzen's native DDR4 3200 and tested at three different timings, a tight CL14, a more common CL16, and the CL18 setting that a lot of budget kits have been using lately. Now, I'm gonna sort of blaze through these because I think the results really speak for themselves. Regardless of the game that you're playing on integrated graphics, going from loose timings to really tight ones 
doesn't affect frame rates to any measurable amount. And yes, that even goes for the 5700G. So I guess these results point towards a few facts if you're looking for the best memory for AMD's new 5000G series. First of all, frequencies are a whole lot more important for integrated graphics performance than memory timings. Just don't jump onto the bandwagon and assume that you should get a no-name kit on liquidation, since loosey-goosey timings will have a negative impact or effect on overall CPU performance. But you also shouldn't break the bank on picking the fastest running and tightest latency kit on the market either. That actually sort of defeats the purpose of AMD's Ryzen 5000G altogether. I mean, this series is meant to provide a cost-effective solution for people who just want a basic system that can still play games pretty well, or for those who are still looking to build a new rig but can't really afford a new GPU because of the situation at the moment. There's actually a lot of diminishing returns here as well. As you go above DDR4 3200, um, kits actually get progressively more expensive, and it's just hard to justify paying too much of a premium for small relative FPS boost. Just avoid running lower than 3200. And yes, I know that there are some pre-built systems out there running at 2666. We know who you are. Another thing you'll need to consider is using the strengths of Ryzen's memory controller to your benefit. And that means buying a good kit of DDR4 3200 and just overclocking it to higher speeds like what we did here. Again, you can use my Ryzen Memory Explained video for some guidance on that. Anyways, I guess that pretty much wraps things up. I'm Ibar with Harukanax, and I actually really hope this video helps. So yeah, on that note, all I'm going to say is um, spend responsibly.